Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis, the channel where we look at complex organic chemistry and explain how it works. In this video, we are going to look at CBD-inspired allosteric modulators of the cannabinoid CB2 receptor. The work that we will be looking at in this video was published by the Franco, Pardo and Alibes groups from the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona in Spain. This work was published in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry in their paper titled Design of Negative and Positive Allosteric Modulators of the Cannabinoid CB2 Receptor Derived from the Natural Product Cannabidiol. So let's start by explaining a little bit about cannabidiol and why it's so interesting to medicinal chemists. Cannabidiol is obtained from the cannabis sativa plant and is the second most abundant of the active compounds following the closely related THC. CBD has attracted a lot of attention as a therapeutic as unlike THC, it is not addictive or euphorizing, which means that it can be taken with much fewer side effects than THC based remedies. Its use is still being studied, but to date we know that it possesses anti-epileptic anxiolytic, antipsychotic, and anti-inflammatory properties, which makes it an attractive starting point for the design of novel therapeutics. The primary targets of CBD are the cannabinoid CB1 and CB2 receptors, but over 60 targets have been reported in the literature, including ion channels, transporters, and enzymes. However, many of the interactions which have been reported only occur at high concentrations in vitro and are unlikely to bind specifically in vivo, and therefore are unlikely to have any specific therapeutic effect. So before we move further, let me explain some of the terminology we will be using in this video for those who aren't familiar with pharmacology. An agonist is a molecule that activates a receptor upon binding. This will typically happen at the orthosteric site, which is the binding site of the natural ligand for that receptor sometimes referred to as the primary binding site. Allosteric sites, on the other hand, are binding sites in the receptor other than the primary orthosteric site. Allosteric modulators change the activation of the receptor relative to orthosteric agonists by binding at an allosteric site. A positive allosteric modulator will increase the activation when a ligand binds at the orthosteric site, whereas a negative allosteric modulator will decrease the activation when an orthosteric agonist binds to the receptor. So let's look at the structure and function of the CB2 receptor, which is the focus of this study. The CB2R is a G-protein coupled receptor, which is a large and very important class of receptor, commonly referred to as GPCRs. These are targeted by over 30% of all of the FDA-approved drugs on the market today. They share a common structure of a receptor which is embedded in the cell membrane and a protein unit which is found inside the cell. The receptor is comprised of seven transmembrane helices with the binding site typically found in the middle of the channel formed by this collection of helices. The protein which is coupled to the receptor is formed from three different protein subunits referred to as G alpha, beta and gamma. There are different classes of these subunits and in the CB2 receptor G alpha is of the inhibitory class and is denoted GI alpha. In the X-ray crystal structure which is shown here there is also a fragment of an antibody which was used to stabilize the trimeric structure of the G protein and allow it to be crystallized. This fragment isn't found in vivo and instead the heterotrimer is stabilized by guanosine diphosphate, but this could not be successfully crystallized. So here we can see the binding sites in the CB2 receptor. In this structure, CBD is found in the allosteric site, while the orthosteric site, which is the primary binding site for this receptor, is occupied by the synthetic molecule JWH133, which is a molecule that was specifically designed to have a stronger binding affinity for the orthosteric site than the natural ligand CBD. 
So now, let's look at the assays that the researchers used to study this receptor. The first is the cyclic adenosine monophosphate assay. This looks at the activity of adenyl cyclase, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of adenosine triphosphate, more commonly known as ATP, to 3,5-cyclic adenosine monophosphate. This AC enzyme is regulated by the activity of GPCRs, such as the CB2 receptor, which inhibits its activity when activated by an agonist. In these assays, forskolin is used to stimulate the enzyme and increase the levels of cyclic AMP. So let's look at just how this works. The CB2 receptor is embedded in the cell membrane and is coupled to the G-alpha subunit of the G-protein, which is also bound to the G-beta and gamma subunits together with guanosine diphosphate. In this form, the AC enzyme is able to carry out its function to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. However, when an agonist binds to the CB2 receptor and activates it, the dissociation of the G-beta and gamma subunits is triggered, together with the conversion of guanosine diphosphate to guanosine triphosphate. The newly liberated G-alpha subunit can then bind to the AC enzyme, which inhibits its activity and prevents it from catalyzing the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Therefore, we would expect this assay to show reduced levels of cyclic AMP in the presence of an agonist. The next assay that the authors used was the ERK-1-2 assay. This assay looks at the phosphorylation of extracellular signal-regulated kinase 1 and 2. The binding of an agonist to the CB2 receptor triggers the phosphorylation of these kinases, which activates them, where they then go on to phosphorylate other molecules and regulate functions such as cell growth and proliferation. We would therefore expect to see an increase in the level of ERK phosphorylation in the presence of compounds which act as agonists for the CB2 receptor. The final assay that we will look at is the DMR assay, which stands for dynamic mass redistribution. This measures alterations in the refractive index of cells which are grown on a biosensor coated microplate. This method does not look at any specific analytes, but instead looks at the overall change in the distribution of large molecules within the cell. Activation of GPCRs, such as the CB2 receptor, are known to cause a redistribution of mass within the cell, and therefore activation with an agonist should correlate with a shift in the refractive index detected by the DMR assay. This method is particularly useful as it allows for the real-time monitoring of intracellular signaling cascades, unlike the previous methods, which only measure endpoint concentrations. So now, let's look at the results from these studies. They first looked at the activity of CBD, JWH133, and the combination of these two molecules together, and assess their activity using the previously described assays. From this, they saw that CBD acts as a partial agonist relative to JWH133, which reduces the cyclic AMP levels in a dose-dependent manner, together with increasing phosphorylated ERK and a change in the dynamic mass distribution. JWH133 acts as a much stronger agonist than CBD due to its stronger binding in the CB2 receptor. The most interesting observation from these assays is the result of the combination of CBD with JWH133, which showed a reduction in activity. This indicates that CBD is acting as a negative allosteric modulator by reducing the activity of JWH133. To probe the mechanism of this allosteric modulation, the authors carried out site-specific mutations. These experiments mutate specific amino acids within the receptor in order to assess what impact this has on the binding of molecules. The first mutation they carried out was a valine, which is centrally located in the orthosteric site. They mutated the receptor to instead have a methionine at this location. This mutation 
greatly reduced the agonist activity of the molecules, confirming that this is the binding site for agonists. To probe the allosteric site, they carried out two different mutations, valine 36 and alanine 2A2. As before, these are mutated to instead incorporate methionine at these locations. This changed the response of the assay to the combination of CBD and JWH133 and eliminated the negative allosteric modulation activity of CBD. These experiments confirmed that this allosteric site is responsible for the modulation seen in the previous experiments. The final mutation they carried out was on serine 2A5. This amino acid contains a hydroxyl group and is proposed to form a hydrogen bond with ligands within the allosteric site. Mutating this amino acid to incorporate methionine, which cannot act as a hydrogen bond donor, only slightly reduced the negative allosteric modulation activity of CBD, suggesting that this does not have a major impact on the binding affinity of the ligand to this receptor site. In order to get a better idea of the structure-activity relationship of these compounds, the researchers synthesized a number of analogues which varied the chain length and assessed their ability to act as allosteric modulators. As we can see here, these compounds have the same structure as CBD, but vary the length of the alkyl chain on the phenyl ring. This experiment showed a very interesting result. When the chain is one or two carbons long, the activity switches and it acts as a positive allosteric modulator and increases the agonist activity of JWH133. When the alkyl chain contains 3 to 5 carbons, the compounds act as negative allosteric modulators and decrease the activity of JWH133, with the modulation activity proportional to the length of the chain. This flip in modulation activity is due to the interactions with phenylaniline 117. This amino acid is proposed to act as a conformational toggle switch, which is able to adopt a transconformation which changes how the receptor signals when an agonist is bound at the orthosteric site. This is the origin of the negative allosteric modulation activity. We can see this conformational switching here in the calculated docking of these ligands within the allosteric site of the CB2 receptor. On the left, we can see a positive allosteric modulator. This has a short chain and cannot extend down to the phenylalanine 117, which is shown here in the pink spaceful model. This is predicted to adopt an exclusively gauche conformation, where the side chain adopts a dihedral angle of 60 degrees. In the molecules with a longer alkyl chain, they can act as a negative allosteric modulator, as this chain extends down and interacts with this phenylalanine. This interaction promotes a conformational switch to also adopt a transconformation with a dihedral angle of 180 degrees. While this one small interaction seems quite insignificant in isolation, it affects the entire receptor and how it behaves and reduces its signaling to the G-protein complex and all the other downstream effects which result from this signaling cascade. So let's finish up by looking at the synthesis and how the researchers made these allosteric modulators. The synthesis began with a Wittig reaction of dimethoxybenzaldehyde with the appropriate phosphonium salt in the presence of Bewley, which acts as a base. This forms an oxophosphatene intermediate, which eliminates triphenylphosphine oxide to form the target alkene in quite good yields of 74 to 99%. This double bond was then reduced using hydrogen gas and palladium on carbon. The aromatic ring then underwent electrophilic aromatic bromination with NBS to form the dibrominated product in quite good yields. To produce the hydroxyl groups required for the target molecules, the ethers were demethylated using boron tribromide. This acts as a Lewis acid and coordinates to the oxygen atom, where one bromide is abstracted by another molecule of BBr3 to form boron tetrabromide, which can act as a nucleophile and displace the methyl group in an SN2 fashion to form the desired hydroxyl group. 
This is the simplified version of the mechanism, but I have included a reference to a paper which goes over it in much more detail. To install the cyclohexanone moiety, the authors used a Friedel Crafts type alkylation. This reaction used PTSA as an acid catalyst, which protonates the hydroxyl group, allowing it to be eliminated as water. Magnesium sulfate acts as a desiccant and absorbs this water, which shifts the equilibrium to favour the formation of the cationic intermediate. This intermediate acts as an electrophile towards the aromatic ring, which attacks it from the face anti to the isoprene group due to the steric hindrance to form the target products with yields of 56 to 71%. With this alkylation now complete, the final step was a dehalogenation reaction to remove the bromine atoms, which had acted as protecting groups throughout the synthesis. The reaction of the molecules with sodium sulfite, triethylamine, water and ascorbic acid promotes a tautomerism from an aromatic dihydroxyl enol type species to an enone which can undergo debromination to eliminate sodium bromine sulfite. This occurs twice to remove both bromine atoms and form the target molecules in yields of 43 to 64 percent. This synthesis is quite straightforward and easily scaled up and will allow for the design and synthesis of more potential allosteric modulators. So in summary, CBD can act as both an agonist and a negative allosteric modulator in the CB2 receptor. By modifying this molecule and changing the chain length, this activity can be tailored to act as either a positive or a negative allosteric modulator. This activity is due to phenylalanine 117, which acts as a conformational toggle switch, which determines the activity of the ligands within the allosteric site and how the receptor can respond to orthosteric agonists. That's everything from this week's Simplifying Synthesis. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you have anything you'd like to see, let me know in the comments down below. I'll be back next week, where we will look at the total synthesis of aturanocytes A and B.